part. It's a, another episode of the Florida Man and Friends podcast. I, I guess, am Florida Man, Rob Cassidy, here in Miami, Florida, where it's pouring outside my window. Uh, joined this week by Kenny Blakely at Howard. Uh, you know, we've got a lot to talk about, I think, with you, and this should be fun. How are things up your way, my man? Man, everything's well. Uh, thank you for asking. You know, being in Washington, D.C. right now with, uh, <laughs> you know, which is the political capital of the world, uh, it's kind of an exciting time. Uh, and it's really neat for our players and I, also our university with Senator Kamala Harris on the ticket. So we're really excited and uh, looking forward to the outcome of this election one way or another. Well, you know, things look like they're going to end well uh, as we record right now. <laughs> so well, we'll see. Uh, I guess we don't want to get too much into that. I'll get an email from work if we start talking too much about that. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about basketball, though, my man. Uh, how's it going with 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 COVID and everything and, and trying to just get practices in and, you know, how different has this been for you than anything else you've ever done? Yeah, it, it's the most uh, surreal experience that you, you, can, you can possibly have. Um, you really learn to appreciate and value uh, the opportunities that you're having uh, right now with everything going on. I mean, Rob, you, you don't know from when one day to the next, uh, you know, if you're going to have your team, if you're going to have players, uh, if you're going to have games even. Um, so it's definitely unprecedented times. I know that's a, a statement that's been widely used, but it's certainly true in this situation with COVID. How confident are you as a head coach that you're gonna, you guys are going to be able to crown a conference champion, crown a national champion, and actually get a season in here? Honestly, I think the only way to kind of 100% secure that is to do things in a bubble. Uh, you know, you look at all the other sports and they certainly have more resources than us. The only sport that was really able to do it at a level where it was 100% uh, kind of sure was the NBA. And, uh, you know, Coach uh, Commissioner Adam Silver did such an incredible job of keeping all his guys in the bubble. Um, and it just worked out that way where, you know, they were able to move their games forward. Everyone remains safe. Uh, no positive tests. So it's a uh, situation that I think is going to be an ever-evolving kind of schedule and year with us in college basketball. I know your schedule is gotten a little bit weird. You guys are playing in a multi-team event, right, with Duke there as well? We're playing in two multi-team events. We are Our first one that we're playing in is the Paradise Jam that's going to be located in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Paradise. Ourselves, uh, Elon, I know, the Paradise Jam in Washington, D.C., right? <laughs> Um, that event will be in a, dub, a bubble. Uh, it's ourselves, Elon, uh, sorry, ourselves, Northeastern, uh, George Mason, and a very, very good Belmont team. Uh, so that'll be at the convention center. The dates on that are November 26th, 27th, and 28th. The second MTE that we're able to play in this year is the Duke MTE. Uh, we will be co-hosting with Duke. Uh, and hosting the D.C. portion of that event. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, Bellarmine is in that, along with Elon. Uh, Are you guys Duke, playing Duke so in that? We're not going to play Duke uh, in that. I was, I, we're not going to play him. I was looking forward to kind of you playing against them. <laughs> it, would, uh, it would only be good in, in, like, you know, PlayStation or something like that. There's too many emotions and, uh, sure. and, and too much love to, uh, to do that. Uh, but, you know... It's uh, Coach K has been great, and uh, you know, for him to reach out and wanting uh, for us to be a part of what he's doing down at Duke and include uh, our university, uh, which was really cool on his part. Well, for people that don't know, you played at Duke, you redshirted on one national championship team, played on the second one. Let me ask you this what do you think? Because I'm fascinated, <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. What do you think it is about Duke that gets people all fired up? You know, you're either a Duke fan. Or the people that aren't Duke fans seem to hate Duke with, with you know, the passion of the sun. Do you think it's something about the, the uniform? Like, what is it? <laughs> I, 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 it's just a polarizing university, right? It's, uh, I, I think it's a lot. You know, we're, we're a private school uh, in a state uh, that is a very blue-collar kind of state. Um, it's a history of agriculture and farming and uh, just being a a state that doesn't, uh, you know, it's, it's a state where most everybody down there is from North Carolina, right? And with Duke, you have so many 
people from New York, you have so many people from Jersey, from Washington, DC, from the Florida area, from LA, and you're, you're, you're kind of known as the elite university in North Carolina when everybody else is more the state university. Um, so I, I think that's part of it, uh, specifically in state. I think another part of it is the success that the program has had. Um, and then I think the third part of it, quite honestly, is Coach K. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's, uh, you know, he's been the one consistent uh, person along with the brand Duke University uh, there. So I, I think he's done such a great job of winning and producing young men that have gone on to do incredible things on and off the court that, you know, a little bit of that is polarizing. It's like the Yankees a little bit. I see your Mets banners behind you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I've been suffering with you for a while. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's one of those situations definitely with, with Duke. It's one of those, uh, you know, people hate winners. Uh, oh, they either love winners true. or they hate winners. So, wait, you're a Mets fan too? I am a Mets fan. Hey, it, hey, that, this makes me even happier to have you on the podcast. We'll do an hour on that. Uh, we won't do an hour on that because people would turn it off. But I could talk to you about Steve <laughs> and everything else that's going on right now. So the hey, I like the move. I like the moves and the directions we're going now. No, it's great. The Wilpons don't own the team anymore. I actually don't feel bad rooting for the team because you know they're not owned by them. <laughs> and it's it's you know it's been liberating. Hopefully, you know, hopefully we get a title or two down the road here. Um, I, I hope ask, that does translate into wins. It should. And I want to ask you one more Duke thing. You were on the team with the Leitner shot. Right. And, you know, everybody's thought of widely as the greatest game in college basketball history. Take me through what you're doing when this like what's going on in your head in the, the, those seven seconds when that's going on. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, the game was so back and forth that you didn't really, you know, you're like, we're going to win because, you know, that's your team. Right. Sure. And that's what you're 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 supposed to think you put all the work and, you know, effort and energy into competing to win. That's, that's why we play, as my man Herm Edwards say. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, Sean Woods makes this bank shot off the glass that's a floater, and it's like, you know, damn. Like, it's almost like the, the air came out of, out of me. I'm just saying me specifically. The air came out of me a little bit. Did you think you were like, going to lose okay. at that moment? At that I'm moment? Sorry? At that moment, deep down inside, did you think it was over? Oh, no. The, the camera was on me, and I'm cursing. Like, I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. Um, but it, it was, you know, but Coach did an incredible job of kind of galvanizing us to understand that we've been in this situation before and that we're going to win. You know, that was, was kind of the first thing he said, we're going to win. And when he said that, it was like, okay, we're going to win. And then he went down the line and he said, you know, Grant, can you make this pass? Christian, can you catch this pass? Like, you know, and he, he empowered everybody in that, that huddle to be able to do the things that we were able to do on those last couple of seconds to, to, to be successful or win that game. You've got an incredible coaching pedigree even beyond him. I mean, the people you've played under and coached under, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I do want to get into the main reason I have you on here, and that's to talk about McCurmaker, Bond Maker's little brother. I think it's a great story. It's a story that's much bigger than basketball. Uh, I'm going to let you lead this conversation for that reason, I think. But for people that don't know, Howard, a coach, landed a five-star, uh, Bond Maker's little brother, McCurmaker. Uh, that had major, high major interest offers, could have went anywhere he wanted to, chose to go to an HBCU. Uh, and how, when did you think you, you might really have a chance here? How did this all kind of come together? Honestly, I thought I had a chance the whole time. Okay. And I don't know if that's just me being a little delusional, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I just really felt that, you know, the way that I could package um, – things for McCore in terms of his development, uh, I think on and off the court, uh, in the classroom, uh, but also his branding. Um, I, I just knew that it was different and unique than anybody else can present it uh, in, that, in that situation to him. So I, I felt 100% confident the whole time. Um, you know, the only, the only time I didn't feel as great about the situation was is that 
you know, he was seriously considering going to the NBA. Um, and I didn't feel like, you know, and I'm saying this respectfully, I, I didn't feel like UCLA or Kentucky had a leg up on us because of them being blue bloods and us being an HBCU. Um, I felt that Howard's brand uh, really is a strong brand and resonates with a lot and so many that, you know, if we could continue to just move forward uh, with recruiting him, that we had a shot at the end of the day when the smoke cleared. Um, and just kind of laying out what has happened subsequently to him committing to us and being a part of our, our program, uh, McCore Maker has had over 1 billion impressions on social media since July 3rd. Like, that's not happening if he's at Kentucky or UCLA. No, not at all. I mean, because then it's not a story. It's, you know, this good kid went to a Blue Blood program, which there's eight of those it's, every year. It's a 24-hour news cycle story that, that's going to just be a little bit of a, a blimp on, the, on, the, on, on social media. Um, but, you know, one billion impressions uh, social media-wise, and that equates for him probably up to about four to four and a half million of marketing dollars exposure, which, you know, when he does – turn professional, now he has a track record uh, with, with, you know, people that may be interested in using him as an endorser um, because he's a very smart kid. He's a beautiful kid. Um, and I, I, you know, all of those things were things we talked about in our presentation to him about coming to Howard University. So it, it, the, the pieces of the puzzle kind of fell right into place, to be honest with you. Reading up on him, and I did a lot before we had you on, obviously, here, it seems like it really meant a lot to him, too, to make this statement that it makes, to go to an HBCU in this political climate at this time. Uh, did you get a sense that that really played into it a lot? Yeah, I, I really do. Um, but, I mean, honestly, Rob, I think if, if you would have asked McCore, um, even before COVID and, and all the you know, social unrest that we had, where he was going to go to school, I, I think he would say if he had to choose one place, it would have been Howard. Um, I think it just felt like home for him. Being here at homecoming, uh, there was probably 80,000 people of color on campus. Um, you know, there was a great environment. I don't know if you know much about the Howard homecoming, but it's considered the best homecoming in the country. Um, you know, you got uh, the baby performing, you got Kanye West doing his Sunday service. The tradition, the history, and the culture was on uh, full force. And, you know, a young man like McCore who understands all of those things and sees the value in them really appreciated, I think, having an opportunity to kind of uh, seeing Howard, uh, you know, for an official visit during that time. But I think also with all the social unrest and everything that has been going on, you know, with the, the, the stuff in our society, it was also a way for him to take a stance um, and be a leader in saying that, you know, this is a situation that I want to embrace. This is a place where I want to be. And it's important for us to think about these opportunities, but not only important for us to think about them, it's important for us to follow through and do them. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing I wanted to ask you too. I mean, I think, and obviously you would know much better than I do, if this goes well, and it should, I mean, the key's talented as can be, is this something that you could see maybe becoming a little bit more common where you've got young people of color that are athletically gifted that start picking HBCUs, picking Howard, picking other schools like that uh, to kind of follow in his footsteps after seeing how great it turns out for him? I believe so. I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be an avalanche kind of concept where there's going to be everybody making a run for an HBCU. But I think there's going to be a little bit of some momentum that's going to pick up with it. Uh, certainly, you know, all eyes are going to be on our program and on McCoy this year to see how this thing works out. And uh, so far, it's been uh, a seamless kind of transition for both. I think he has really uh, embraced uh, our team. He's embraced what we're trying to get done. He's embraced what we're trying to do. He's embraced uh, the HBCU culture of Howard University, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, in saying that, it's, it, it is. We, we, you know, we've been able, we've been able to have conversations with young men in year two that we probably weren't able to have in year one. Um, and we really feel like, you know, coming down the line, we'll be able to attract 
uh, a few of those young men that are probably four and five star kids, but I don't think it's going to be, like I said, uh, you know, a, a, an avalanche where everybody's looking to do an HBCU or Howard type of situation. Yeah, sometimes it feels like it takes one, and then, you know, I, I'm not expecting every top 10 kid to go to an HBCU either, but I think maybe I agree with you, we're going to see more of it uh, for sure. When people do tune in to see Howard, and I think a lot of people are going to tune in to see Howard this year uh, and to see him, what are they going to see out of him? What are they going to see out of Howard? Uh, you know, what kind of style of play can you expect to see from him and from for you guys? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. I, I, it, it allows me to talk about a little bit of some of our other guys. Yeah, um, but with McCore, we're going to he, – he's so talented and he's so versatile that we're going to play him all over the court. Um, at times he'll play point guard and at times he'll be, <laughs> you know – I'm I being serious. At times he'll play point guard and at times he'll be, you know, in the post. Um, he, he's really, really skilled, Rob. He can shoot the ball out to the NBA three-point line. Um, he's very good at, at handling and getting by, by people. Um, he's doing a great job of working on the defensive end. So um, I think his versatility will allow us to kind of be a little dynamic in a way. We have uh, a young man, Steve Settle, who – Great story. He went to my high school, the Matha Catholic High School in Hyattsville, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, he was a guy when he went to the Matha, he was 5'9 as a freshman. And when he graduated high school four years later, he was 6'9, but he only weighed 155 pounds. So, um, you know, his body wasn't prepared to really do the things at the next level that. Uh, you know, that his game was able to do. So we took, we took Steve, we redshirted him for a year. He put 30, 35 pounds on his frame. And uh, now he's much stronger. He's capable. But Steve can play any position from the one to the four for us in the way we play because we play five out on the perimeter. So we you have another young man, Jordan Wood, uh, a 6'9", six, 6'10", six, freshman from San Antonio, uh, Texas. That is a... Uh, I thought he was a steal, um, to be quite honest with you. He's, uh, he can really stretch the defense. He has a high basketball IQ, and he's a great decision maker. And he's probably a lot better of a defender uh, than probably when you look at him, people will give him credit. Um, we were able to get Nogel Eastern, who had started 65 games at Purdue, um, played in the, the Elite Eight game, uh, was really, really good there, uh, started – you know, at a number of different positions. So his versatility uh, and his experience being a winner will really bring a lot of value to our program. Um, we have Raheem Ali, a young man from Baltimore Poly High School uh, that was a three-time state champion at Poly. Would have won his fourth uh, championship at Poly and would have been the only player to ever win four Maryland state championships uh, if it wasn't for COVID. So we really like our young guys that we brought in, uh, you know, and the guys we have coming back, Wayne Bristol Jr., who was Rookie of the Year. He, uh, he's a 6'6", 6'7", two-guard that was a 40, 50, 80 shooter last year. Um, you know, we have Khalil Robinson coming back uh, to our team who started at point guard uh, before he got injured last year. That did an unbelievable job. He had a two-to-one assist to turnover ratio. Rob, I really like our team, uh, but we're just young as heck. Um, but we're really, really tall. We could start at some point in time or play at some point in time four guys that are 6'9", six, 6'10", six, or taller uh, at the same time. And it'll be a new look for sure. I mean, I think some people are, are, you know, people that don't know anything about Howard or haven't listened to this podcast now will look at the four wins will think, oh, okay, you know, this is a one-man team now. But, you know, they don't understand the other newcomers. They don't understand what you lost the injury last year. Uh, what's the biggest difference altogether right now than the team that you ended last season with? Well, I think, like, when I got the job last May, um, you know, one of the things that happened was that we had 50 points either graduate out of the program or transfer out of the program before I got hired. So we knew it was going to be a tough year. We knew it was going to be challenging. Um, you know, so we went through the year. I think I was able to start to develop a culture at Howard. I think we were developing uh, what 
who become the future of the program. Um, you know, we played young guys last year, and I knew it was going to be rocky. I knew it was going to be rough. Uh, but I think in doing that, we were able to move the program forward for year two and hopefully year three and four because those guys were able to play 30 minutes a game or 25 minutes a game. I think the biggest difference from year one to year two is we have more depth and we have, I think, a really high basketball IQ. Um, I love the way that our guys are able to pass, dribble, and shoot. The skill level and the basketball IQ of our guys is really, really good. Um, so it allows us to be able to play in a way where guys can trust one another because they know that they're going to make the right play for their teammates um, at that particular time. I wanted to talk about your coaching pedigree. We touched on it earlier. You played under Coach K. You played under Morgan Wooten in high school. You coached under Lefty Drizel. I mean, these are – there aren't very many people walking the planet <laughs> that have that kind of coaching pedigree, you know? What, what are those three guys – is there a trait that kind of – that they all have, that, that all three of these greats have that kind of bring them together? Or are they all different manners of great coach? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think that the, the traits that they all have is that – they're great communicators and that they're really, really smart. Um, it's kind of funny because Coach Lefty Drizel and not too many people uh, of the young generation probably remember Coach, but, you know, Coach coached at Maryland. He coached at Davidson. Uh, he did some incredible things. He's one of the winningest uh, college coaches in the history of the game. But Lefty had a personality of uh, wanting to sell himself short or wanting people to underestimate him, uh, which was pretty neat kind of like chess, you know, board kind of strategy that he would play. But Lefty had an undergraduate degree from, you know, Duke, and I think a graduate degree from like William and Mary. Um, so, you know, you got this guy that's acting like a, a Southern, like, you know, uh, a guy that doesn't, you know, like the elevator doesn't go all the way up. And Lefty's a freaking genius. And, and that was really, you know, one of the things I took from, from Coach, um, you know, Coach K, uh, you know, hot, uh, West Point, uh, you know, Army, like Duke, like such a, such a brilliant, you know, thought leader. Um, and, and, I, and when I say that, like those two things, he, he's very thoughtful and he's a leader. Um, and, and, and just such a, you know, insightful kind of like guy that, uh, you know, just sees, sees things just totally different in the way he views, I think, life, people, and the game of basketball. And then you have Coach Morgan Wooten, who's at the time was like my grandfather, but uh, just so wise, so smart, and such a, a articulate communicator um, where all of those guys made the teaching part of the game and life lessons that they surrounded the game with very seamless. Are there lefty stories out there? Because he's kind of got a reputation for being pretty crazy. Are there, are there any ones that we haven't heard yet? That... Well, I, I, I think, Rob, what was pretty cool is that, you know, our whole staff would get fired every day. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? He, he would literally, he'd be like, you know, Kenny, look, look here, I'm going to fire your ass now. I'm going to fire you. Like, he would literally fire the staff every day. Um, <laughs> the first time that happens, do you have to turn to somebody and be like, are we really fired? <laughs> <laughs> the first time I was like, Chuck Rizal was on staff. I was like, Chuck, is he serious? Chuck was like, nah, you're all right. <laughs> that happens. <again. laughs> but uh, Lefty was amazing. We would, we, would have, we would have meetings that started at 9 o'clock in the morning that would end at like 3 o'clock, and we would have practice at like 3.30. You know, so it, 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 <laughs> what are you talking Lefty. about? From, what are you talking about from nine in the morning until three thirty? You guys talking about the point guard's grandma or what? What, what, do you, what do you get? What do you get into here? He was such a detailed person that he would want to go over everything. But I think you know, with Coach Coach Lefty, one of the things about him was that I, I think he hated to be by himself, and he always wanted to be around people that he liked or loved and that he could trust. And that was just a way of him you know, wanting to kind of show us in a way that, you know, he was, he was inclusive with us and down with us. And uh, it just a, just a kind of way, I think, for him to just be around people. He had, uh, 
you know, he and his wife have a great loving relationship. And, uh, you know, but at the office, he wanted to be around the guys. He wanted to be one of the guys. You also, Jay Billis was a coach on that Duke team, correct? Yes. Did you see him continuing on in coaching, or did you see him becoming a clown like me? <laughs> or did that take everybody off, off guard? Well, I don't know how many people know this, but Jay was an actor growing up in, uh, you know, the hills of California. He was a theater uh, kid? I'm sorry? Like a theater kid? Like an actor? Like a stage actor? Jay was in a movie, and it was a sci-fi movie, and I, I, I kick myself right now that I cannot uh, know the name of this particular movie. But uh, he, was, he was one of the lead actors. And so, so Jay always had, had this personality uh, about him where, where he wanted to be in front of the camera. And uh, so, you know, it was one of those things for him uh, that I think was a natural progression of, hey, getting my MBA uh, going to, you know, law school and then, you know, being in front of uh, the camera, which he's become, you know, the face of ESPN college basketball. And uh, he does one of the best jobs of anybody in the country reporting game uh, for ESPN. Let me ask you this. If you're, you know, you're on that team, you find a sci-fi movie with your assistant coach. Do you guys just roast him? Like, how did you guys find this thing? <laughs> I, that's a great question. I don't remember how we found it, but it was like we, you know, because back then it was, it was, you know, you're watching a VCR. Like you're not. Uh, they had the physical tape. Yeah. So it wasn't like you could actually Google this at the time and say like Jay Billis, you know, movies. It was like you, you, you find this thing at like, you know, the blockbusters on a Saturday night at like, you know, 12 o'clock at night. When <laughs> so. What kind of movie was it? Is it is he playing like an alien or like who's he playing here? Is he playing he's like a, a space total star? alien in the movie? He's a total alien in the movie. <laughs> Rob, I can't. I it, it just. I, I wish I could remember the name of it. I'll right find now. it. I'll do everything I can to find <laughs> it. We'll play a clip of it. <laughs> all right. No, that would be great. That would be great. All right. A couple more things. First of all, I've been doing this thing with every coach I have on the show. We had Bruce Weber on last week. I did it with him. I like Colin. Almost got him. Are there recruiting stories about guys that, that you feel like you almost had, either whether it be at Howard or elsewhere as an assistant, that got away and ended up being pretty darn good? And, and let's talk about those stories. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, one for me is the young man, Pat Connaughton. Okay. Pat Connaughton is from, uh, you know, he plays with, uh, I think Pat is with Portland Trailblazers right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but Pat was from the area around Harvard. Uh, he went to a high school called St. John's, the Baptist. And Pat was a, uh, a pitcher, uh, a big-time pitcher. He got drafted by the Baltimore Orioles. Okay. I saw him after his sophomore year, going into his junior year, uh, down in Florida. I was, I was getting off of uh, – I was getting into my car. I was at Orlando at the Disney AAU event, going to my car – uh, to grab some lunch, and one of the coaches from his, his AAU team saw me and goes, hey, does that H on your shirt stand for Harvard? I said, yeah. He said, my name's Kenny Blakeney. Nice to meet you. He goes, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm going to get some lunch, but what's up? He goes, can you come watch our game? He was like, I think we have some kids that you would really like. So I was like, all right. I went and watched the game, and it was against a, uh, like the Arkansas, you know, really good wings or something like that. Arkansas wings. And Connaughton had like 43 points. And I'm like, okay, is this real? <laughs> yeah, so because, I, yeah. I stayed, I stayed and watched the next game. He goes off for like 45. And I'm like, I called coach amateur. I'm like, coach, there's this kid, man. That's like incredible. Like we got to be all over him. So I recruit him all that year. And we're in a great place with him because nobody really knows about him. He's playing his AU games in the back gym. He goes to a school that nobody knows about. And, you know, we're in a great position. So the following summer, his senior year, he comes to our team camp, our, our, our elite camp at Harvard. And he just finished playing baseball. And he stunk the joint up. Oh, no. And Tommy's like, this kid can't play. I'm like... Oh. <laughs> Later on in the summer, 
he gets his legs under him. He, he's got Kentucky, he's got Florida, and he ends up going to Notre Dame, gets drafted, and he's been in the NBA now for about six or seven years and done, has done a really good job. All right, I got two things, though. One, even as me, a guy that, that's not recruiting players, but a guy that is evaluating kids and, you know, people, if somebody comes up to me in a parking lot and is like, come see these kids, I think you'll want to rank them, I'm not going in there. <laughs> there's, there's, what told you like I would find an excuse to not because usually in my experience when somebody's approaching you in a parking lot to do something like that it never turns out well what, what yeah, was it I mean, that, that quite, kind of quite, quite honestly that's just kind of the guy that I am in terms of the, the work um, you know I now you call me lazy <laughs> no 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 I, I've just been the type of guy that has really tried to uncover every rock that I could um, and everything that I've ever done, like, because I've been at schools where you had to be a little bit different and unique. Um, you know, it's, it's been one of those things that I have really have had to just do things in a way that, uh, you know, if a guy at the, in the parking lot says, hey, come watch a kid, you know, I'm going to go watch that kid. Hey, well, it turned so, out well this time. Did you ever, did you ever give, and I told you so, to Amaker about this or? I, I, I wouldn't do that to him, but I, I, I you know, I would see Connaughton or, or we, we'd be watch, like watching Notre Dame or something like that. And I just, you know, shake my head or just kind of <laughs> look at him sideways or something like that. <laughs> uh, the last thing I got for you is, is another standard question I've been asking everybody too. If this was your league, you control the NCAA, you could change one rule. What rule are you changing? Whether it be recruiting or, or anything that they do, what do you think needs to be kind of, kind of messed with, tinkered with? Yeah, I think we're heading in that way, but to play to pay players. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think the pay players with the name, image, and likeness thing coming down the pipe, uh, I do think players should be compensated. They are the talent uh, that brings in a lot of money to a lot of universities and businesses and companies. Uh, so I do think that is something that, uh, you know, we should take a look at, and we are taking a look at it, and I'm glad that it's coming down the pike in that direction. Hey, Kenny, I got to tell you, you're one of the few coaches that believes that, and it's refreshing, man. Like, you know, I believe it too. Obviously, I think anybody that's a fan of the sport believes it. You don't hear a lot of coaches say that out loud for some reason. I've been saying it since I was a student athlete, and I, I say it respectfully, but I just remember, you know, Duke uh, Bookstore, and I wasn't good enough to be a guy to get paid, right? But, you know, I remember living with Bobby Hurley uh, when he was a senior, and we're scraping up nickels to – you know, figure out a way to go enjoy our Friday or Saturday night. Um, and we're literally <laughs> scraping up nickels. Um, so when, when, you know, you're in college and a bookstore is making, you know, millions of dollars off of T-shirts and we're scraping together nickels to try to, you know, have a good Saturday night, you know, wow. those, those thoughts certainly cross your mind. Sure, um, they should, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, like you're, you're at Duke in the, in the early 90s and you're playing every game on national TV. Um, you know, you have those thoughts of like, hey, like this Everybody's is getting rich, except for you. Everybody, everybody's eating. Yeah, except for the people out there actually playing, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I think for me, that would be the one rule. All right, Kenny, I appreciate your time. It's Kenny Blakeney of Howard. Man, this has been great. I'm going to be, you know, wishing you well and, and watching. And man, I, you know, I wish the best for you. This, is, uh, this has been great. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate you so much, man. Anytime. Let's do it again sometime. Seriously. I would love it. I would absolutely love it. We can talk some baseball also. We will. We'll, 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 I'll start a Mets podcast and we can do it. I appreciate you. <laughs> there you go. All Take right. care. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. See you.